the company of curlews. Chapter 2 To Mark a Man A few years later, 15 years old, sitting with my uncle Di in the corner of the snug of the Eagle Inn. We'd been out most of the day, cockling down the estuary with my grandfather. He gave us a shilling and told us, no more than a pint of mild now and get yourself, that's what he said, get yourself a couple of faggots from Brian a butcher on the way home. We sat there quiet like, Di watching me, copying everything, my every movement, nervous he was. I sip my beer, Di sips his beer. I shuffle and scrape my chair, Di shuffles and scrapes his chair. Nice, I ask and nod to him. Aye, nice, he says. I finish my beer, so does Di. Beer drips down his chin. He can't quite keep up with me, can Di? One more Di, the glasses clink. I pick up the two in one hand, not waiting for an answer. Oh, what about supper, says Di? Mam will have the cowl on. You and your mam. Nana Lol's cowl will still be there when we get back. One more. I insist. Di nods agreement and follows me, stands behind as I stick my head through the serving hatch to the public bar. Uh, two pints of mild, please, uh, um, uh, Mrs. Fish. I hesitate as I say her surname. I've heard others call her by her first name when asking for a pint, but I don't dare. I've been walking out with her daughter, Branwen, but she don't know. No running water, I see. Glasses washed in a pan. Shelf behind the bar holds the dimpled pint and half glasses. And the top shelf, the bottles of the strong stuff. The whisky and the gin and the rum and the sherry and the port. June Fish ignores me. She swills a glass, dries it with a cotton dish rag. She holds it up to the window looking for blemishes. She nods to the old man supping his beer at the end of the bar. Mild needs changing, Jeff, she says. Jeff finishes his pint. Stubs out his woodbine and with a bowed back shuffles off to the rear passage for a new barrel to be ramped up onto the front counter. An old boy is puffing away reading a daily, his back to the window. Churchill's going, says you, he's not well, poor dab. Another old boy moves around the table. Rehearsing the dangle of a chained wooden ball. Lining it up, one eye cocked to hit the target skittle, the only chance he has of knocking down the nine wooden guardsmen. Coracle men and a couple of young farmers are sitting, some in admiral chairs, some on high stools, huddling around a roaring fire, telling tall stories reminiscing about life on the river. I listen in. I'm telling you the truth, says the first one. Them coppers would pay us to help them find them. And when we found them, we'd hide the body by the White Bridge. White Bridge, says one of the young farmers. Well, where do you mean? White Bridge, man, says the first. Same as the bus school, the railway bridge, you know. A second coracler takes up the story of the bridge. He slowly explains. Brunel built a timber bridge back in the day. Painted white it was. I got the feeling the one he's talking about was built after. But we still call it the White Bridge. It's funny watching him. You can see the first one is getting uptight about not being able to tell his story. Ditton, he says. 
I'm in the middle of a story, eh? Huh? Just hush, man. He starts again, once they all shut up. We'd go back then, up reverse, eh? Cast a net and get, get a run in out of season. Bailiff wasn't going to ask questions, was he? And we got a few shiglins. Shiglins were the three pounders, salmon or suin that the coracles would catch. Oh, when pulled thee, oh, they're talking about my grandfather now. He found Dick Salmon in the river, down by the White Bridge. Old poacher that he was, Swansea jail, two weeks. Bit harsh, mind. Aye, says the first. Nasty man, mind in the end, that Dick Salmon. His wife was happy, though. When he got put away, he should have break from him bothering her. Thirteen children, mind. He never got the grips of their names. He didn't know who was who. Owen been his butty, says one cutting across. Partner on the river for donkey's years. Stuck by him thick and thin. Lost his nerve, he did. But Owen wouldn't take no money for finding him. Dick was drinking all sorts at the end, poor beggar. There's a younger man with them. In the middle of them all. It's at Ralph Richards. He's trying to impress the older men. Ah, he says. My father found one not far from the twenty-two. Not a nice sight, mind. He'd only been in the river twenty-four hours. It was all a bit messy. Well, he looks over towards me. It was our Anthony Francis. The police paid my dad for finding him. Bit simple he was, mind. His mother went off her head as well. I pushed past Di with glass in hand and slammed through the half-glass door of the bar. He hasn't even seen me come in. In my anger... I trip over my own feet, virtually fly through the air, smashing the glass into the side of Ralph's head. He falls out of his stool, clutching his face, thumps his head on the woodpile by the fireplace grate, blood pours down his face onto his white collar. My brother, Anthony Francis, berated by his peers, I decided to skip school that next day. He needed to outfox the whipper in and wandered down to the 22 alone that Monday morning, thinking to have a go on the swing without the jibes and banter of his peers. Patent black shoes bought the week before by his mother are placed carefully on the grassy bank. They mirror Anthony fully clothed, squelching through the mud bank of the low tide. He feels his feet being sucked down every step he takes. The rope in the middle of the pool is out of his reach. He tries. His feet stick once again, like the day before. This time, not on the green grass of the bank, but ankle deep in sludge. This time, it's not an awkward dive into a full pool that he can paddle out of. This time, he falls belly first. This time, it's a canvas of congealed coffee-coloured silt. There is no solidity. His hands push up his head ever so slightly. He calls for his mother... The slime-scape struggle for life begins. He screams for me, his older brother, then asks for his mother one last time. Eels curl and slither around his hands, handcuffing themselves tight, holding him fast in the slop. The mud will soon fill his mouth and suffocate his cries for help. No one has heard him. His hands claw at the mud in front of him and the whispering river, tied on the turn, gently murmurs and slowly fills the twenty-two. Bubbles gently rise to the surface. 
all is quiet except for a whinnying horse in the field beyond. <laughs> 